Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And welcome to Meet the Press, Patty Thank Davis. Thank you. <laughs> it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. So let's talk about your beautiful book, Dear Mom and Dad. This is really a letter to your parents, and it comes after you've written about your family before. Why did you want to write this book in this way right now? Well, I've wanted to tell this part of the story for a long time um, because I think making sense of your family and processing everything and, you know, moving beyond, um, you know, whatever happened in your childhood and whatever wounds you've been carrying around, all of that stuff is a journey, you know, and it's and it's not a smooth journey. And so I, I really had kind of reached the end part of that and I'd reached a place where I could stand back and look at look at my family, look at things through a wider lens and look with more understanding, more forgiveness, more compassion. And so I'd wanted to tell this story and um, I actually been trying to make a documentary called The Reagans Before the World Moved In, kind of based on that premise and that desire to tell to tell sort of the finale of this of this journey, right? And um, it didn't work out very well because every time I thought a producer would be okay, they'd start trying to take it away from me and like, you go sit over there, dear, and we'll tell your story for you, right? And you didn't want anyone else telling no, your story. No, it was very patronizing. It's like, what do you know? You don't know anything, you know? Um, and um, so anyway, so my editor, Bob Weil, um, called me and had this idea for this. He said, a small book and a letter to your parents. And I thought, oh, my God, I never would have thought of that format, ever, ever. What was it like to write this letter to your parents, and how do you think they would respond to it if they could read it? Well, I'll answer the first part of that first. Um, it was, um, I mean, I was totally willing to like dig deep and, and be completely you know, honest and everything and raw. But I think doing it in this format um, made it even more raw and more, um, and, and more, uh, made me more able to dig deeper. You know, because you are picturing saying things to them that I never would have said if they were in front of me, uh, particularly to my mother. I just never would have. I would have been too scared. Um, so it was a brilliant idea for a format that he had. I mean, what would they say? Well, my, um, if my father were here, he'd be 113 years old, so he probably wouldn't say that. <laughs> but that aside, um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think he would. I think he would be fine with some of it. I think he would feel sad with some of it. You know, I mean, he didn't. One of the realizations that I came to was that. As a child of an alcoholic, where would my father have learned to be an available father? He and it took me a while to really look at that and and accept that. You know, where would he have learned conscious parenting? His, you know, his father was an alcoholic. Um, you end by saying that you wish you had shared more with them mm -hmm. while they were here, which is so powerful. Yeah, I do. Um, like I said, some of it I never could have shared with my mother. Um, and I think I did, I did share a lot with my father during the 10 years of his Alzheimer's. I mean, as, as odd as it might sound, I got to know him better during those 10 years than I ever did before in my life because I was willing to, because I went, okay, you know what? You got to grow up now and you got to put the past away and enter into this situation and ask, what can I learn from this? You know, I mean, I've said that to people about Alzheimer's a lot. Instead of asking, why did my loved one get this disease, which there's never an answer for, it, it's an understandable question, but it's the wrong question. Instead, what can I learn from this? How can I grow from this? Yeah. Why was it important for you to, as you say, delve into this very personal space to round out the other accounts of your family in this very personal way? Well, because all the messiness of our family has been so public, um, partly because of me. Don't buy those other books. <laughs> Just buy this. Um, um, you know, I felt like I, the world has known a lot of the story, and they should know this part of it, too. But also, and primarily, because I'm not the only person 
who has messiness in their family and challenges and difficulties and fractures and all of that. And if the work that I have done on this and the insights that I've managed to gain can help other people, then I want to do that. You know, I ran a support group that I created beyond Alzheimer's for caregivers for six years. So I've heard a lot of family stories and it, it really, um, it really deepened in me the knowledge that we're not that different. You know, families are messy and they're complicated, and particularly when disease enters the picture. So if I can say to anybody else, hey, you know what, this is what worked for me, then I need to do that. I kept thinking as I was reading your book that it is raw and deeply personal and challenging at times, but also in some ways like a love letter. It is. To your parents. Yeah. It is. Is that how you saw it? Yeah, it is. Because I, I, um, I finally learned to look at them as these complete people who had childhoods that were pretty messed up on their own, particularly my mother, who edited and redacted her childhood across the board. But the fact of the matter is she was dumped at three years old by her mother with relatives she'd never met before, left there for six years, and then her mother came back and said, oh, I met this doctor, and I'm going to get remarried, and now we're moving to Chicago. Let's go. <laughs> right? How do you think that impacted her, that I think it, it, abandonment? Yes. But, not, but to her, I wrote about this, to her, the way she edited the story was, I totally understood that mother had to go and do her work as an actress. She was three. She didn't understand that. She just knew mommy's driving away. So you learned to feel compassion for yeah. your three-year-old mom. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And in an environment that I am assuming was not that nurturing because she never talked about it. Mm. Ever. And so I don't know how much... And those are very formative years. I mean, three years old, who potty trained her? Who came into her room at night if she had nightmares? You know, who, I don't, nothing was ever talked about. I think she was a very lonely, um, desperate little girl who developed some survival skills as a result of that that made her a very formidable and controlling woman, you know? And you write about, the foundation or lack thereof mm -hmm. um, that your parents provided. And, and you write about it in the context of their relationship. And this quote that you have in the book really stood out to me. You say, the circle of just the two of you was the overriding reality of our family. It dominated everything. Many years later, I told someone that as children, we had the sense that if we were spirited away by pirates, you and dad would miss us, but you'd be, be fine. fine. Yeah. I said it lightly with humor, but it was because of that impenetrable circle that we were a family with no real foundation. foundation. That yeah. must have been really challenging as a yeah, child. Yeah, I mean, it is, and I, I use that biblical phrase of building a house on, on sand versus building a house on rock. And and it, it was that, you know? There was, no, there was no familial foundation there. They were this entity, and we orbited outside of it. And, you know, we all knew that. But, and I've written about this too, when I look at home movies, and I look at older photographs when it was just the three of us before my brother was born. I was six when he was born. I, it was different. I mean, I, I look at my mother in those home movies, and there was tenderness there, and there was like a joy of motherhood that comes across in those that definitely dissipated as, as the years went on. But, you know, there was love and tenderness there, and that's part of the story too. And I think that's something that I want people to take away from this in their own situations, that if you can think of any times, even if they're only like little slivers of time, when there was love there, that's part of your story too. And it is almost haunting when you talk about going back and looking at those home videos. It must have been emotional, incredibly emotional to look back. You know, at it's those funny. Memories. When I was a little girl, my father used to roll up this screen, you know, in the living room, and he'd play our home movies, and it was like, oh God, I don't want to <laughs> see these again, you know. And then when I was older, he, he, you know, I quoted him in this. He, well, you've called our family dysfunctional, but you weren't. Look at the home movies, and I would go, oh, you know, they don't tell anything. And but when I looked at them later, 
I went, no, they actually tell a lot. They tell a lot, you know? You also write that there were moments when you actually felt afraid of your mom. A lot of moments. <laughs> Why was that? Where did that come from? She was, as I said, she was a formidable presence. And, you know, there was just, I, I wrote this, we were like America and Russia, you know, we were just at, always at odds. And um, I seemed to be the person who angered her no matter what I did, you know. So I was very intimidated by her uh, up till the uh, up till and after she died i mean when she died she died in the middle of the night and um it was a long time before the coroner could come out because they needed a police escort and they needed all this stuff to get her body so her body laid there in bed for you know like half a day mm. and i remember standing there looking down at her and saying to myself okay she's gone she's gone she is nowhere on this earth but there was another part of me that was going, I'm not so sure. I was <laughs> waiting for her to pop up and tell me to cut my hair, you know? I just couldn't really believe that she was actually, like, she's just kidding. <laughs> is, is that, was that divide because you were a very strong-willed person in your own right, do you think, from a young age? Maybe, but, you know, I think no matter what I did, it was just going to be there. Mm. Um, I think... My mother was always better with males than females. So when Ron was born, it was, you know, there is, this, there is a moment, and I wrote about this too in our home movies, when Ron's a toddler and we're in the swimming pool and I go splashing over, they're on the raft, and I go splashing over and there's no sound in those movies. This is from a long time ago. Um, but, you know, I'm real happy to splash over there. And she, like, pushes me away and says something harsh. I don't know what. And it, it's a moment that kind of resonates with me because I thought, okay, now we're on the downhill slide. It now happened that the, early, you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you, and, and through writing this letter to your mom and dad, do you think you've made peace with your mom? Have you come to terms with I have. With you know why? Because fear? I, I'm sad for her. I'm sad for her that she never got the, well, maybe early on, but after that, she never got the joy of motherhood. You know, it was not... It just kind of wasn't her thing. <laughs> um, she never really got that, you know, that overwhelming love and, um, and I, I don't know, joy that, that mothers have for their children. And I'm sad for her that she missed that. And I was sad for her for the whole time that my father was ill mm. because she didn't have the fold of a family around her because... It had been so fractured. I mean, I was there for her, and sometimes I, you know, it was fine, and I was welcome there, and, and sometimes it was tense. Um, but she didn't. She didn't have that, and so it, it makes me sad for her. You didn't have the same standoff with your father, but you did have your differences with him, differences in viewpoints. Mm -hmm. How did this book impact how you reflect and feel about your dad? Well, I've always felt more tenderness toward my father than my mother. I mean, my father and I were not at odds, except, you know, obviously when I was, you know, doing demonstrations and things like that. But a lot of it, a lot of the tension between us was because I had tension with my mother. And he and she were such a fused circle that, you know, well, if you don't get along with her, then I'm going, but, you know, I, he couldn't see my side of things. So... That sort of got in the way. But um, I think, you know, everybody sort of wanted more from my father. He had a reserve about him. It was a very sweet reserve. It was a very endearing reserve. But there was a reserve about him where people were always reaching for more from him and trying to figure him out. People are still trying to figure him out, you know. People are still writing books about him and trying to figure him out. And I... I said to someone, I don't know, recently, I think, that to understand Ronald Reagan, you have to understand that everything about him bounced off the fact that he was a child of an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Everything. Whether you want to look at his politics, his policies, the way he governed, the way he lived his life as a family man, everything bounced off of that.
It took me a long time to really get that. Do you think you fully understand your father, having written about him so extensively, having written this letter to him? I understand him much better now. And I, as I said, I came to understand him better during Alzheimer's because, you know, Alzheimer's is a peeling away. So I got to see that young boy who was nearsighted and just, you know, had his nose in a book because he couldn't see anything outside of that and had this alcoholic father um, in the house. Um, and, and I got to see, like, different phases of his life because, in all, like I said, it's appealing away with layers and the person goes back through time. So you get to see that. And I, um, I really was very deliberate about being very open in, in that experience to learn from it and, and grow as much as I could. I am going to ask you about your father's Alzheimer's in a moment, but I want to ask you about your activism, what, what you just referenced, the fact that in the 1980s yeah. you became very outspoken and you yeah. write the truth I have to live with now is that while I was appearing at rallies talking about world peace, the only thing being communicated was that I was at war with my father. Yeah. Why did you want to be so outspoken while he was still president? Okay, so I, when he was elected president, I mean, I did not want to be the president's daughter and I did not want any of this, you know. But I thought, I remember sitting there in my apartment and thinking, Okay, well, maybe maybe I can do some good here. I was already involved in the anti-nuclear movement, but no one cared until he was going to president. It's like <laughs> I was just another person there. Um, so it was something that I passionately believed in. And I thought, okay, well, I can use this to bring more attention to this this issue that I feel so strongly about. But, you know, I was young. I was 28 years old. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, <clears throat> I mean, I have to kind of forgive myself for that. You know, that I, yes, of course I'll do this demonstration and I'll stand up on the stage at the Rose Bowl and I'll, you know, be kind of a thorn in his side in a way. Um, if, I, if I were then the person that I am now, I would go, okay, I can speak out, but I can do it in op-eds or I could do it in an interview. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do it like that. Um, and I think, you know, that's the difference. That's like I said, what I, I kind of have to, if somebody else said to me, well, I did this in the past and I regret it so much, I would say to them, well, did you know any better at the time? And if you didn't, then, then you didn't. So you, you know, don't you regret your actions. You I just do, but I also then have to say, but you have to like forgive yourself for not knowing any better. I didn't sit there and go, I'm really going to hurt him. I didn't do that, you know. I thought I was doing the right thing. You know, and then and I did try to forge this relationship or this dialogue, rather, between him and the anti-nuclear movement and the activists by bringing Helen Caldicott to the White House. I mean, that was I thought, oh, this is like the best idea I've ever had in my life, you know, and I wanted it to be an ongoing series of of um, communications and meetings between him and anti-nuclear activists. And that was just not to be, because after that one meeting that was disastrous, that was it. But I, but I wanted it for him, too. You know, I wanted people to see that he could listen to the other side, to people who he disagreed with. Well, another major issue that he grappled with as president was the AIDS epidemic. Yeah. Um, and you write about this. And one of the moments that you write about is how he explains sexual orientation to you. His friend yeah. Rock Hudson, of course, passed tragically. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that moment. What did he say to you? What so, was that moment like? Yeah, so I was young. I mean, I don't know, eight, nine, something like that, maybe. And we were in the den. It was just me and my father. And we were watching. T I was sitting down. He was in the chair, and I was sitting down on the floor, like, by his legs. And it was Rock Hudson Doris Day movie. I don't remember which one. And, mm -hmm. and they were kissing. And I went, that's weird. <laughs> and, and my father went, what do you mean? And I said, I don't know. It just looks weird. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, he said, um, Rock Hudson doesn't really want to be kissing her. He wants to be kissing a man. 
And I think I said, my memory is that I said, oh, like Aunt Gleska and Aunt Emily, because we had these two lesbian aunts. They were called Aunt and Aunt. They weren't my aunts, but, you know, you called them that. They were a couple. I mean, to me, they were a married couple. They stay, They babysat us when, when my uh, brother was like two or something and my parents went to Hawaii. They slept in my parents' bed. They lived together. They were always together. To, they were a married couple to me. So I was not unfamiliar with this. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, yeah, that's why it looks strange to you. It's fascinating because that's such a personal moment, and he clearly was in some ways ahead of the curve in terms of being yeah. able to yeah. share that with you at such a young age, and yeah. yet you say you were disappointed to some extent by his public response. I'm heartbroken to the AIDS by it. Crisis. And I'd wanted to write about AIDS for a long time, like in an op ed or something, you know, and there was just never really the right opportunity to, to do so. So when I started writing this, I thought, well, I'm going to write about this now. Not to make excuses, not to really make it anything other than what it was, which was a failure, but to try to explain some things. Mm -hmm. um, primarily that, you know, one of his character flaws was that he delegated things to other people. Mm -hmm. And then he didn't, he just believed that they would tell him what he needed to know, which was not the case. And there were very homophobic people in his administration. There were people who believed that AIDS was God's revenge on gay people. I mean, who went that far with it, you know, and did not want him talking about AIDS. And it was when Rock Hudson died that they, they kind of went, well, we can't keep it from him now. And he, but he allowed things to be kept from him. And as I wrote in here, you know, for, for someone whose timing usually was pretty impeccable, his timing failed pretty much every step of the way in that. So I can't make it anything other than what it was. But what I, I can say is to people who think, oh, he didn't care about gay people or he was homophobic, that's not true. Have you forgiven him for his response, what you say was a failed response to the AIDS crisis? Oh, that's a hard question. I don't know. I mean, I guess I need to. It's a tough one. I mean, I, I had friends who died and um, I don't know. Your mom. I definitely have not reached the top of the mountain when it comes to forgiveness. <laughs> Your mom encouraged him to speak publicly. She did. And you talk about it in the context that she was often a shield for him in the, from some of the people in his administration who were maybe leading him astray. Yeah, but that see, that puzzles me too. Because yes, she was, and yes, she pushed him a little bit, but... I don't understand why she didn't push him more. Mm. She knew people who were dying of AIDS. Her hairdresser died of AIDS. Um, she had lots of gay friends. So I don't, I don't understand that either, mm. you know, because he listened to her. And, and I, don't, I don't know why, like I said, I don't know why she didn't push him harder. There's so much that I don't know in that. You write of your father's policy positions, um, and this is specifically about abortion, you say you would probably be amused by that. After my public rebelling against your policies, I have occasionally taken on the task of trying to explain a few of your positions, not to excuse or endorse, mm -hmm. but simply to shed light on how I feel you arrived at some of them, like abortion. Yeah, like abortion. Yeah, I mean, Except, he was yeah. pro-life with exceptions. Yeah, well, he the, the bill he passed in California, was yeah. that was revolutionary. I mean, before that, girls couldn't, I knew women who went to Mexico and were blindfolded as they were led into clinics. How do you think he arrived at that position? And, and, and I guess, what do you think he would say today in the wake of Roe v. Wade being overturned? I mean, I, I don't know. I, um, I don't think he would like a lot of what's going on right now, and I think that 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 is probably one of them. What I, mm. what I explained in this book, and I, I also the first op-ed I wrote for the New York Times was about his views on abortion, mm -hmm. and how, in my opinion, he was very influenced by the fact that he and Jane Wyman lost a baby, two right. days old, yeah. who he never got to see yeah. because he was ill with pneumonia, literally fighting for his life. Mm. And so he never saw, so there was this baby that was just, it was born and it was, she was gone. And I think that the, the dialogue that anti-abortion people use 
um, resonated with that grief in him mm. that I don't think he ever really allowed himself to feel, you know, because he never talked about it. He, I never knew that Christine Reagan even existed until I was in my 40s. How painful that revelation must have been. You know, Edmund Morris been. said, I'm going to dedicate the book du Dutch to Christine Reagan. And I said, who's that? Mm. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't even know. Right. 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 Uh, was it painful when you realized that history? Yeah, yeah, because I thought, you know, if you don't, if you don't explore your grief, if you don't acknowledge your grief, then it's going to claim you in other ways, and you're going to play it out in other ways, and it's going to become this whole sort of tangled mess. I think one of the um, incredibly powerful moments of the book is when you talk about your role to the rest of the country. America kind of sat with your family at the dinner table. Yeah. And it's only through your father's illness yeah. that you were able to forgive. And you say, it wasn't until you got Alzheimer's that I came to appreciate America's companionship. Yeah. People approached me with compassion, with sympathy. We were in a realm beyond politics. There was no way that everyone who spoke to me agreed with your politics. Mm -hmm. They were responding to you as a human being, not just a political figure, and there was sustenance to that. Yeah. How did that impact you? Very powerfully. I was living in New York still when he was diagnosed and then yeah. released his letter to the country and the mm. world. And, you know, this was 1994. People were not talking about Alzheimer's. This was really revolutionary that he did this and was so open about it. And so I'd be, you know, walking around Manhattan and there were people who would recognize me and then come up to me and tell me about their own situations with a parent or a grandparent or, or an aunt or uncle, whatever. And, you know, I knew that they were telling me things that they probably didn't even tell friends of theirs. They were telling me really personal things. And then, and then they'd just be gone. And I, I sort of felt like I was in the French underground or something, being given like little bits of information <laughs> from these people I was never going to see again. I was kind of piecing together all of this yeah. information. But I started to feel like there's this network of people around me in this country who know about my situation and know about our family and my father who, are, who feel compassion for us. And so it, it it did. It was like this this odd kind of companionship where it was before I was so resentful of the entire country. <laughs> <laughs> Understandably so. You felt like the country had taken yeah, away taken from your family yeah. and your father. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could reflect on today's politics. You write this beautiful account of Tip O'Neill visiting your father, his hospital bed. Um, and how different our politics feel today, the inability to reach across the yeah. aisle and, frankly, to form those types of bonds where you can yeah, debate they, vigorously yeah. in Washington but be there for each other on a very personal level. What do you think your father would say about our current state of politics? I think he would be so... I think he'd be appalled, really, you know. And, um, yeah, they used to have martinis together, two you know, old Irish guys, like, sharing a drink after... You know, it's like two lawyers battling it out in court and then going to having a drink together, you know. Um, and, I mean, it was more, it was just more civilized. And I, he didn't understand lack of civility. He didn't mm. understand um, attacking another person. I mean, he could be, you know, pretty pointed in his, in what he would say about someone else. But he didn't understand cruelty. And that's what we're dealing with now. And I think he wouldn't understand that. And I think he would be, um, I think he would be really scared for our democracy. Um, and I, I think that, I, I don't, I don't know who, I think he would address people more than any candidates, you know. I think he would address the American people at, at what has, what has divided us. And, I mean, in my own opinion, and I think, I don't know, I think this probably is how he would think, is our divisions really started because we're, because we're all so scared. Mm -hmm. There is so much fear around whether we're going to get shot in a mass shooting or our children mm -hmm. are, or, you know, if you walk into a store, is there going to be, a, or a church, or wherever, you know, we're scared. And 
fear morphs into anger. It just does. It's not sustainable. We don't want to be afraid. We don't mind so much being angry. Mm. And, you know, there are people on the public stage and on the political front who understand very well that synergy between fear and anger and who are masterful at exploiting it. The other big issue that has been in the forefront right now is the issue of age. Your father, when he was elected at the time, was the oldest person elected president 69. at 69. I know. Now, obviously, the president is in his 80s. Former President Trump, the front runner, is in his late 70s. Do you think there should be cognitive tests for people running for the highest office in the land? Probably, yeah. I mean, in just what we know about what age can do, it doesn't always do that, but um, it would probably be a good idea. Yeah, I know. My father was 77 when he left office after two terms. It seems so young now, doesn't it? Yes. Did it seem at the time old to you? We talked about your dad as being, at the time, the oldest president. Um, I don't think it did because, you know, it was it was um, it was 87, I believe, when he stood in front of the Berlin Wall and said, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. So that was not someone who was, you know, fractured in in age. I mean, yes, I probably thought he was old because he's my father, and we think that about our parents. But um, you know, not not in the way that that we're talking about now. Um, do you think that? And and I guess the question is, what do you think of political families now? Obviously, we spend a lot of time talking about the adult children of our politicians. Do you reflect on that at all, the intense scrutiny yeah. that families get still yeah. to this day? You no, know, I mean, I was, I mean, I hate, I did not like being first daughter at all. I didn't like being followed around by Secret Service, and I wrote about signing off from them after four years. Um, I mean, nobody could do that now. The world's too dangerous. The country's too dangerous. You know, I mean, they, uh, well, my brother did it first. I wrote about this. My brother Ron signed off from them first, and then I went, oh, you can do that. And so I, you have to write this letter, and then they send someone, they send one of the suits down from Washington to basically try to scare you, you know. And they sat in my little apartment at the dining room table, and he was telling me, well, you know, there could be kidnap threats, and we can't protect you and stuff. And I said to him, okay, anybody looking at the Reagan family isn't going to go, Oh, let's take Patty. Who would pay for me? (laughs) So I went through the next four years with no Secret Service protection, which helped a lot. I didn't have. You weren't afraid. I was never afraid. Wow. No, I was never. But that's the difference. I mean, now, if if there were a first family in the White House and somebody like texted me or something or wrote me and said, you signed up. I think I'm going to do that. I would go, don't do that. <laughs> because <laughs> the world now is not, I mean, yes, there were dangers, yeah. but don't do that. <laughs> well, you know, that leads me to my next question, which is you had one of the most famous last names in the world in American politics. You decided yeah. to change it. Yeah. Why? And do you ever regret that decision? No, I don't. Because like most children of famous parents, I just wanted my own identity, you know, and I wanted five minutes when someone met me to just sort of size me up and and like look at me as a person rather than governor's daughter. I was a teenager when I decided to to change my name and I went through all these different names. I mean, you know, little hippie chick that I was, I thought of like a single name. I remember Raina was one of them. I thought I'm going to be Raina. Because I was writing poetry at the time, I thought that's good. I'm gonna write poems in Reina, you know. Um, and then I thought, well, that's kind of stupid. And um, and I didn't want to anger my parents. I couldn't like go to them and go, I'm going to be Reina now. <laughs> right? So there were limits for yeah. you. So I yeah. didn't want. I did not want to hurt them. I didn't want to make them angry. And I thought, well, my mother's maiden name is Davis. There, I mean, there are like 85 million Davises around. I mean, that's not you know that doesn't like set off any alarms and people. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll do that. I'll be Patty Davis. And I remember having that conversation with them and trying to explain to them that I just want someone to look at, at me as a person just for a few minutes before they figure out who I am. Do you think they understood? They did understand and they weren't mad. Yeah, it actually worked. A, a moment of connection between all there three There was of a you. connection and they, yeah. they actually... 
they did they did understand yeah they were very accepting of it so much of the republican party um to this day still speaks about wrestles with debates your father's legacy tries to emulate what do you think your father's message would be if he were sitting here today to the country to our current politicians I think he would want people to look at one another as human beings. You know, that's why he and Gorbachev were able to do what they did, which was world changing at the time, because they looked at each other as human beings. And and that's what's missing now. You know, these were two people who were put on the stage of history at a moment in time to in my opinion do what God intended them to do. They might not have, you know. but they were both two people who i think had the same agenda of looking at each other as a human being gorbachev came to my father's service in washington dc i got to meet him he's he was a very shy sort of vulnerable person i mean i only met him briefly but you know that's the impression that that i got from him when i met him you think we've lost that ability to look at each other as human beings yeah i do i do for the most part yeah is there anything that gives you hope when you look out at America at this country um i don't know it depends on what day of the week you ask me i think <laughs> you know i mean i want to have hope i want to have faith that we will get through this that we will come back together but but like i was saying i think that i think because there is so much fear and anger because anger always sits on top of fear that it's hard to find that faith You know, it's hard to to really say yes. We're and and you know that's what is. I, I didn't grow up in calm times. There was the civil rights movement. There was the women's movement. There was the anti-war movement. It's not like America was calm and happy, but there were people like Martin Luther King, like John Lewis, and many others, who were rooted in this faith that that America could function from her better angels. you know that that this was still a great country which was remarkable always to me because if you think about what Dr King and John Lewis experienced and witnessed to have that faith was really remarkable i don't see that now it's not there they're not eloquent voices out there there are but i don't feel that i don't feel that rootedness in absolutely you know we can do this we can get through this i believe in this in this country i don't see that and just finally how do you when people read your book i read it as a daughter as a mom and took so much from it from oh, both you. places what do you hope people take from your book from sharing opening up about this deeply personal part of your life and your heart i hope they look at their own families and and go okay how can i look at this differently how can i take a step back in the same way that you take a step back from a painting to really see the whole picture how can i step back from my family and my life and and look at it differently you know and look at it through more mature eyes and and um through a more complete vision um and then if you can do that with your family you can do that with other people right people are are more complicated than they appear to be. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.